Now, the young KGB officer Vladimir Putin took the collapse of the Soviet Union as a personal humiliation. It is illuminating to hear how he identifies now as the one to redeem what he sees as a lost glory. Pulitzer Prize-winning author and editor of The New Yorker magazine, David Remnick, joins Walter Isaacson to explore Putin's past. Thank you, Christian, and David Remnick, welcome to the show. Good to be here, Walter. You were a uh, bureau chief in Moscow for The Washington Post in the late 1980s and early 1990s. When Russia was going through this openness with uh, Gorbachev and then Yeltsin, you won the Pulitzer Prize for that great book, Lenin's Tomb. What happened? Why have we regressed to an authoritarian regime? Well, I, I, it's, a long, it's, it's, it's literally a long history. Uh, Russia has been under authoritarian rule for a millennium and a communist rule for seven uh, decades. The Gorbachev moment was uh, an interregnum of great promise, much talk of democracy, even democratization. Um, and the 90s were incredibly chaotic, and we know the history of that. So we shouldn't underestimate the power of the historical tug um, toward uh, what you now see as Putinism. Really, what is Putinism? Putin who was installed by Boris Yeltsin um, uh, at the beginning of the 21st century, and very quickly, very rapidly, certainly within a couple of years, he became the standard bearer of Russian resentment toward the West, toward Europe, for a whole host of reasons. You remember, Walter, that he viewed the collapse of the Soviet Union not as the liberation of Ukraine and Azerbaijan and Armenia and the Baltic states or, or the possibility of, a, of, of, of democratic promise or any of those things. He viewed it as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, his words, not mine. And as time has gone by, his resentment toward the West has deepened and deepened. And, it, and we've seen instances quite quickly also uh, of his ability to use violence um, and revenge and, and fury uh, exacting upon his own people in Chechnya. Um, that, that's the way power began with, with, uh, with Putin. So it's just gotten worse and worse and worse, and people are, some people are only awakening to it now. So in other words, we should have known at the beginning Putin was going to be this way, or has he changed radically? Well, I, I don't think Putin was ever a great uh, uh, somebody who felt that Gorbachev was on the right track. He's always felt that uh, Gorbachev was a fool and weak and uh, a plaything of the West. You know, he, he comes from a certain background. Um, maybe it's useful to go through that. He, he comes from Leningrad. Um, you know, his, his father uh, went through the war. Uh, and in the most horrendous and yet typical way, uh, he entered the KGB. He was not in the elite strata of the KGB by, by any stretch of the imagination. And he experienced the fall of the Soviet Union while being a kind of mid-level lieutenant colonel in, uh, in East Germany. And he experienced the collapse of the Soviet Union as the absence of power, as a humiliation, not as a moment of promise. You know, he, he saw what was happening in Germany as a catastrophe. And uh, so, and he comes out of the KGB. Walter, I, you know, I can't emphasize enough how the KGB as an institution and as a network um, didn't disappear with the end of the Soviet Union. In fact, it took advantage of it in many ways. It became in large measure part of the elite. It took advantage of it in business and never more so than under Putin. Was he most provoked by the expansion of NATO, or is he worried about liberal democracies rising on his borders, or is this just really clinging to power? All of the above. All of the above. Uh, you know, Putin uh, changed the Constitution not long ago so that he basically will be it until the end of his days. Be into the end of his days. Uh, NATO has been a debate uh, and a point of real contention with the Russians from the very moment of the collapse of the Soviet Union, if not before. You remember this is happening during the George H.W. Bush administration, and there's, there's a long history of that. But I think 
you know, as the, Ukraine is concerned, Ukraine has been independent since 1991, since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And Putin has never accepted that. And more and more, he's delved into the esoterica of 19th century Russian nationalist texts to derive a sense that uh, of the great Russia, which is Russia, uh, uh, white Russia, which is Belarus, and uh, Mala Russia, the small Russia, which is, is Ukraine. That's 19th century nationalist language. He believes it. He believes Ukraine is not a country, and he believes Ukraine, Ukrainians are not a people. And what you're seeing with this invasion is an attempt to bring Ukraine as a nation and Ukrainianness to its knees through um, the complete um, uh, step by step annihilation of civilian population, right? Through terror. That's what's going on. Do you think that uh, NATO should have expanded to include Ukraine? No. I, I, you know, it, Clearly, you know, Ukrainians now feel they, that that might have been a good move. But I, right now, I don't think that is very much in the discussion. Um, look, I want any number of things to happen at once. I we want the war to end. Above all, you want to see the suffering end. But look at the listen to Ukrainians. Watch what Ukrainians are doing. They're putting everything on the line to defend their nation, their Ukrainianness. And to fail to be moved by that and persuaded by that um, and to have to, to discount that into your thinking, I think, is, is something extremely odd and mistaken. Um, it, you're seeing Ukrainians putting themselves in har harm's way in the most extreme and moving and astonishing ways. And I, I think we have to take that very, very seriously. Do I think a no-fly zone? Do I think a no-fly zone is, is a good idea? And recklessly engaging Russia in war? No, I do not. No, I do not. Do I think there are easy ways out of this? No, I don't. I, I wish there was some easy uh, you know, answer. Uh, anybody suggesting an easy answer, an easy resolution to this, considering who's in, who's in the driver's seat, who's, who's exacting the punishment here, Vladimir Putin, I, I think is deluded. So do you think Ukraine can actually win this war and that's the resolution of this? Well, what, what, what constitutes winning? Does constitute winning that the Russians uh, all of a sudden on Wednesday retreat and the tanks head back to uh, head north toward Moscow? That's hard to imagine considering the sheer preponderance of armaments that they have. But I think what we've seen now in three weeks of fighting is that a vastly uh, outmanned uh, Ukrainian army and defense force among, among the civilian population uh, that has far, far fewer armaments has fended off what Putin had hoped to be a blitzkrieg, a decapitation uh, of Ukrainian power, um, probably the arrest, if not worse, of Zelensky and his, his aides and other officers of the elected officers of the Ukrainian government. He had, he had hoped and probably been told by Defense Minister Shoigu that that was possible within a week. So the Ukrainians have pulled off in military terms, if not even in spiritual national terms, a kind of miracle. And even if they lose in the most conventional sense, even if Kiev is quote unquote, taken, it is almost a certainty that what would commence from there is an insurgency. This is an enormous country, Walter. I know very few people uh, or some, not a lot of people are completely familiar with it in detail. This is a country of 40, 45 million people. It's an, it's an enormous space in Europe. It's a complex uh, country. Uh, from east to west, and taking it, you know, in a matter of days or even taking it at all is not a simple matter, as Putin is finding out to his pain. And at the same time, at the same time, he has to deal with potential uh, unrest or uprising from two directions. Um, first is the street, and second, probably more consequentially, in his own house. 
So he's trying to deal with the street by a complete information uh, cone, by trying to fend off the internet, independent press, and all the rest. Now, that's only partially effective um, and, and might get less effective as time goes by. How is he dealing with the people around him? Well, he's got a bunch of loyalists who are not of the top rank sometimes, because that's what happens in authoritarianism. You don't pick the best and the brightest. You pick the most loyal and sometimes the dumbest. Um, will they rise up against Putin? Will they see this as a catastrophe that they can't bear or countenance? I think that's what U.S. intelligence is studying every single day. Do you think sanctions will work and uh, cause real pain in Russia? They already have caused a lot of pain. The question is, have they caused a lot of pain to the right people, and have they, has it happened rapidly enough? Um, you know, we hear a lot of talk on television and in the press about the oligarchs, and that bears clarifying. It's, that term was used during the Yeltsin years to define about seven to nine people who got into business with, with the Putin, uh, with, excuse me, with the Yeltsin government and who were essentially given or given unbelievably great preferential deals on certain huge and influential businesses. And they had enormous influence on Yeltsin. I'm talking about Berezovsky, Gusinsky, Khodorkovsky, and so on and so forth. That picture changed enormously when Putin came to power. When Putin came to power, he told those nine people or dozen people, whatever it was, you are not allowed in politics anymore. If you want to keep your ill-gotten gains, fine. Stay out of politics. Tell me about The New Yorker. It's had the most uh, astonishing coverage. How difficult is it for your reporters who are there? Well, it's difficult for all reporters. We have Josh Yaffa, who's based in Moscow, but who's no longer in Moscow. He just spent a month in Ukraine and wrote an astonishing long piece that's out this week. Um, but like so many reporters, has had to leave because it's now illegal try on this Orwellian sentence, it's illegal to write the truth about the war, whether you're Russian or, or not. Uh, Masha Gessen um, has been in uh, Ukraine and, and has been in Moscow and now is, again, out of Moscow because, you know, same reasons. And we have other people coming through and um, Luke Mogelson is a, a war reporter and Caesar has been working on uh, refugees we have all kinds of people who are uh, reporting on this uh, in just extraordinary and extraordinary complex and horrific uh, complex of events. A couple of them have been on our show. Tell me how they're trying to get through the disinformation and uh, censorship. Well, they pick up the phone. They talk to people. I mean, nobody's censoring us. I mean, we're, we're blessed by uh, a freedom of the press and a ownership of the New Yorker that uh, allows us or to, to publish what we want. Um, the censorship issue is, has to do with the ability to have reporters in Moscow, in Russia, and sending dispatches out. I mean, you've seen the New York Times Bureau, which is a, a you know, much bigger and more complex animal. That's disbanded. Um, and CNN, I think a, a lot of, I, so far as I know, all of them, BBC, it's, it's terrifying. And, you know, I, I and it's an indication of what Russians already do, those who are in the know, fear for the future of Russia, which is that Russia will become um, cut off from the world. You know, the old metaphor was the Iron Curtain. I don't know what the new metaphor would be. Um, but it's hard to imagine in the age of the internet and modern communications that that can be anything like it was. But, you know, Russia was in many ways, in limited ways, and with all the caveats about the authoritarian nature of the state, in some ways was joining the world, right? In business terms, uh, Russians traveled much, much more widely in the post-Soviet era than they ever did before. Uh, people, you know, middle-class people going to Turkey or Greece on cheap flights. This, this became part of life. If, you know, again, I'm not talking about oligarchs, you know, more and more students abroad, pe people joining the world. Will this, with this 
horrific uh, war end. Now, that, 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 that's a big concern for a lot of Russians. And, and, and I would say tens of thousands of Russians have left in the last three weeks and now find themselves living in Azerbaijan, Armenia, Turkey, and, and all the rest. And they feel they're stranded. In Lenin's tomb, you have a sentence that I really find memorable, which was once the system showed itself for what it was and had been, it was doomed. Is Putinism doomed? Well, that sentence was written because it tr tried to get at a larger truth. One of the things that Mikhail Gorbachev did as General Secretary of the Communist Party and then as president was to come to the conclusion without a real reckoning with the truth, without coming forward and saying, this is our history for all its complexities and tragedies and barbarities too. This is our present for all its faults. Without reckoning with that, we can never modernize. We can never move forward. We cannot live in an Orwellian present and we, and, and because we will never achieve a decent future. That was his conclusion. He was right. Uh, God knows the United States is not perfect, not even remotely so. And we are reckoning with our past when we are honest with ourselves every day and should be. Uh, whether it has to do with race or income inequality, wh whatever it is. Our history is something that we have to reckon with and deal with and all the rest. Putinism wants no part of that. One of the things it did in the run-up to the war in Ukraine is it shut down an organization called Memorial, Memorial, which studied the Stalinist past, which, which had uh, you know, opened up archives. My, own, my wife, whose um, uh, grandfather died in a camp in, in Russia, was able to get the archives through Memorial when it first began many years ago. Um, that's just one detail in the way that Putin has increasingly moved on history and truth, not in a way that resembles ex Stalin exactly, but in a, in a modern way um, that is, has been extremely effective, unfortunately. David Remnick, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure, Walter.